Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's edition of the TD Show. Uh, my name is Chris Brown, I'm the Feeder Events Manager for US Chess and also National Tournament Director. Tonight, I am joined by Associate National Tournament Director, Alan Hodge. Alan, good evening. Good evening, Chris. Thanks for having me on the show tonight. Oh, you are very welcome. It's my pleasure to have as many tournament directors on the show as we can possibly get to uh, let everyone have a chance to provide their wonderful knowledge and wisdom to the tournament director crowd. Alan, my usual question to everyone is how did you get into this uh, this gig? So let me let me ask you, how did you become a tournament director? Well, I think I got there by a rather common path. I moved to Massachusetts in 1997 and discovered the Metro West Chess Club. And it was run at that time by a TD named Mark Caprellian, yep. who recruited me to join the club. And shortly after that, recruited me to be a TD. Okay. And, I think uh, Mark is still heavily involved in the club as well. He right? is, yes. I found out uh, just recently that he was back to running it 23 years later. But okay. <laughs> uh, I was one of several TDs that I know about that Mark recruited and trained. So my hat's off to him. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes, I've, I've been to the Metro West uh, a few times since I'm, I'm local to that. But uh, yeah, no, it's great. I, I think most people will find it, um, you know, get recruited or end up doing it because nobody else is, is there to do it. I know that's not the case at the Metro West. They, they have a good uh, crowd that seem to recruit a lot of people to try and help. So it's, it's good. Yeah, it's a good club. Anywho, let's uh, dig into tonight's wonderful subject. So tonight's uh, subject is score sheets. Uh, I know we all love the fact that people have to keep score and we all love uh, providing score sheets to players. Um, I, I jokingly published on the Facebook uh, post when I was advertising this, we were going to discuss the, the best type of paper to produce score sheets on and whether you can make paper airplanes out of them and stuff like that. Sadly, we're probably not going to answer those questions tonight, but um, we will answer a bunch of other questions relating to score sheets, the rules around them, when you can keep score, when you don't have to keep score, and all that fun stuff. So let's dig into uh, the rules, first of all, and we're talking about section 15, um, which is all about um, keeping score. And um, 15A, the manner of keeping score, is the first rule you've come across. And it says a player uh, is required to record the game, both his and uh, the opponent's moves, uh, move after move as clearly and legibly as possible uh, on the score sheet prescribed for the competition. Uh, it gives uh, three types of notation that are permitted, uh, algebraic, descriptive, and computer notation. I will leave it to the chat folks to see if anyone can provide an example while I talk about the rest of it of what computer notation looks like. Um, the player must first make the move and then record it on the score sheet. So make the move first, then record it. Uh, score sheet shall be visible to the TD and the opponent throughout the game. Alan, anything we need to expand on here? Well, I like this rule because it looks so straightforward, but there's actually a lot of stuff behind the scenes, if you will. And you emphasized the legibly part, which I appreciate. Uh, the phrase I would pick out is the move after move, which suggests to me that at no time in a game, uh, barring time pressure, which we'll talk about, should anybody's score sheet be more than one move behind what's actually happening on the board? Exactly. So yeah, um, and as you said, legibly. So that that rules out um, dashes, um, you know, as uh, le legible moves. Um, and nobody came up with an example of computer notation in the chat, unfortunately. Uh, computer notation is a little old, um, and it's just basically the the squares. Yeah, there we go, Rob. So it's just the squares that a piece came from and the square a piece came went to. Um, you don't have to mark an X for capture. You don't have to write down the name of the piece that moved. So it's just as uh, Rob stated in the example there, E2 to E4 and E7 to E5 a response. And if then you bring the knight out, you just put G1-F3 uh, because whatever's on G1 moves to F3. So yeah, computer notation, who knew? Um, let's move on to um, the next uh, 
um, piece of information. And this talks about a paper score sheet. So we'll, we'll quickly uh, discuss paper score sheets and the new-ish uh, electronic score sheets that have been around for about 15 years now, I think. Uh, so the player using a paper score sheet is allowed to first make the move and then write it on the score sheet or vice versa. Uh, and that's a variation. So it's not the main rule. So this is the paper score sheet variation. And it does not apply to electronic score sheets. If you're using an electronic score sheet, you must make the move on the board first and then notate it on your electronic device. Uh, remember, the score sheet should be visible to the TD and the opponent throughout the game. That's basically a repeat of what we saw in 15A. Uh, but this does um, allow someone using a paper score sheet to write the move down and then make it on the board. And then there is this TD tip uh, that discusses uh, the use, you know, using 20C, which is the use of notes, um, prohibited. TDs can penalize a player that is in violation of 20C if the player is first writing the move and repeatedly altering that move on their score sheet before completing a move on the board. So, um, you know, this is the paper score sheet variation. Uh, it doesn't need to be advan ad advertised in announce, you know, in advance, but I would highly recommend that you. Uh, at least post it at the tournament uh, that you are actually using this variation to avoid any issues. And um, as Harold uh, Stenzel pointed out in the chat there, um, except when claiming a repetition draw, um, you know, where you are allowed to write the move, but then in that case, you don't make it on the board. Um, you just write the move. And if your claim is wrong, then you are at least, you know, held to making that move. So uh, on the board. Alan, anything you'd like to expand on uh, for this before we touch on electronic devices? Yeah, there's one comment. Uh, most of what I do deals with Scholastic, so there's always this question about how tolerant you should be about people who like to write the move before they make it. My own view is that when a rule becomes a variation, it's halfway to being eliminated. Uh, so for that reason, when I deal with younger players who are just learning tournament chess, I try to emphasize the news rule uh, and encourage them to move first and then record it, even if the, the variation allows them to do it the other way around. Logically, it seems to me like it's hard to write a move down that has not yet been played. So I think the new rule is, uh, is more cogent for that reason. Yeah, I, I think my idea of a score sheet is it always is meant to record what actually happened, not what is going to happen uh, in right. the majority of cases. So, and it's very hard for that to happen if you're writing it down before. Um, and it does bring up the issue, like it says here, about 20C. Uh, if a player writes it down and then scribbles that out and writes something else down, scribbles that out and writes something else down, you, you then have to sort of deal with that and try and stop that from happening uh, because it could be a violation of 20C. Um, let's just quickly touch at this point on paper score sheets and electronic score sheets. As I'm sure you're all aware, there are electronic score sheets that are allowed um, to be used in um, US chess rated events. Uh, if you've been keeping an eye on um, some of the issues regarding electronic score sheets, you'll know that there was a big um, deal made of US chess actually um, not allowing electronic score sheets now at the National Scholastics, um, unless someone applies, uh, applies for some sort of medical exemption to that. Um, so organizers are indeed allowed to bypass um, and, and promote their own variation. If they do not want to allow electronic score sheets in their events, uh, I believe they have the right to do that, but they should advertise that. Uh, a lot of people have paid a lot of money for these devices and want to actually use them. Um, and I'd like to show you all now where you can go ahead and find that information on the US Chess website really quickly. So you can keep that information in your back pocket and you can go and see which electronic score sheet devices are currently approved. So let me see if I can show you the US Chess website here. So this is the main page for the US Chess website. And right here at the bottom uh, in all of these options here, you'll see a tournament directors link. If you've never clicked on that before, uh, give it a whirl. Um, I'm actually in the process of making it look uh, actually within the new website. But then if you come down here, I think seventh option down, you'll see approved score sheet devices. 
uh, go ahead and click on that. And that takes you to a recent article, uh, February 6, 2020, talks about US Chess electronic device certification policy. Uh, so let me see if we can bring that up. Is everyone able to see that? I believe uh, it looks like everyone can see this. I'll zoom in a little bit. Uh, so this is policy and guidance for certification. So this talks about um, use of the electronic notification devices, etc. Uh, section one is overview and background. And the part you really want is uh, section two, currently approved devices as of January 29, 2020. And this talks about the Monroy, DGT, Ply Count, Chess Noter, Chess Cast, and also the Chess Note. Um, I think the R should be backwards there, but the tablet version. So that's like the bigger version. So right now, these six devices are the only ones approved for use in um, US chess rated play. Uh, if you go ahead and, and allow a device that's not one of these, um, you know, that's up to you as an organizer. Uh, we highly recommend that you don't. Uh, but, you know, as an organizer, you can um, do whatever you would like um, in terms of um, score sheets and, you know, approving them for use or not. But these uh, six devices have all gone through this um, application uh, process through US Chess where it's been reviewed, etc. And there's a lot of uh, things here that it's meant to do and not meant to do. So yeah, um, if you um, want to allow US Chess, uh, electronic, US Chess approved electronic devices in your tournaments, then this is the place where you come and find all of that information. All right, let's get back uh, to the uh, presentation. So um, what do you do if a player is unable to keep score? Um, so sometimes you get players determined by the TD unable to keep score due to physical handicaps um, and they can have assistance in scorekeeping as described in 35F and we'll look at that in a second. Uh, it should be excused from scorekeeping if such assistance is unavailable. Uh, players determined by the TD to be unable to keep score for religious region reasons um, so uh, during the Sabbath, say, uh, Friday evening, rounds usually cause problems um, for, for such a thing. And then uh, beginners who have not learned to keep score may be excused from scorekeeping at the TD's discretion. You usually find in scholastic events, um, some of the lower levels, beginners, etc., are excused from keeping score um, just because they don't know how to uh, or it's very difficult uh, for them to do so. Alan, uh, what happens where you are? Is that, uh, does that usually, do, do you have sections where you excuse kids from keeping score or beginners? Well, we do. And a few years ago, uh, the way we were defining our sections wasn't very optimal. And there was a lot of confusion <clears throat> that led to many players, especially uh, beginner players, drawing the conclusion that scorekeeping was optional. Uh, so we addressed that and now we define our sections very clearly, uh, sometimes by grade, but usually by rating. And we make it very clear in our advertising that if you're in a particular section where notation is required, you are expected to notate. And if you don't know how, you'd better learn or play in a lower section. Since then, we haven't had any issues. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I like it when when people keep score. It's it's something that you know you should learn as a chess player, especially if you're playing tournament chess. But I also understand the need for you know the the very beginning people to uh, it it is difficult to get to get used to and whatever. So so there are exemptions in the rules that allow you to uh, exempt people from keeping scores. Let's touch base a little bit on the um, the thirty five F um, rules. So there are scorekeeping options. Um, an unsighted player or disabled player may keep the score of the game in Braille uh, by using a tape recorder or by using any other specially designed device. So, uh, you know, uh, unsighted player uh, can legally move those, uh, use those. Um, so sometimes you'll hear them using a tape recorder to keep score or whatever. And then also 35F10 uh, is the main part that refers to scorekeeping. Uh, so a blind, visually impaired, or disabled player shall have the right to make use of an assistant uh, who shall have any or all of the following duties. And there's a bunch of duties listed in there, but number C is uh, item C is the one that we're most uh, 
interested in for this particular show uh, to keep score for the blind or disabled player and to start the opponent's clock. So um, you can have an assistant keep score for you. And then if the blind, visually impaired or disabled player using such assistance, the other player, his opponent, uh, the non-disabled player is entitled to and must provide his or her own parallel assistance should he or she so desires. And that's to just <clears throat> make the game between the two of them as equitable as, as possible. So if the uh, blind player is using an assistant, the non-blind player is also allowed to use an assistant. However, um, you know, they, they have to provide that uh, assistant for themselves. Um, sometimes what happens is uh, uh, a, such a play, player will let you know that they're coming to an event and as an organizer or tournament director, uh, sometimes you wish to try and help them find an assistant which is fine, um, and then you know you're you then ask the opponent if they would like the similar assistance too, and it could be you could have the same person uh, keeping score for both players if if need be. So, uh, anything you'd like to add to this, Alan? Yeah, I'm good with that. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> yeah. So let's get on to uh, the act of keeping score and when you have to keep score. Uh, so score keeping in time pressure. Uh, so this, remember, time pressure is defined as a player having less than five minutes uh, or either player having uh, less than five minutes uh, in remaining in a non-sudden death time control here um, and does not have additional time. So that's an increment of 30 seconds. So if either player has less than five minutes, you don't have a 30 second increment. Um, both players are excused from the obligation to keep score until the end of the time control period. So if either player has less than five minutes, both players are excused from keeping score. This is a, a difference from the FIDE uh, rule set that uh, where you yourself have to have less than five minutes uh, for you to keep uh, not keep score anymore. But um, anyway, it, and then it warns you that doing so, however, may make it impossible to claim a draw by triple occurrence, 50 move rule, or a win on time forfeit. So score keeping by both players must resume with the start of the next time control period. And missing moves should be filled in. Note that this little bit at the bottom here relates to non-sudden death time control, and that um, that does become important um, later on. Alan, anything you'd like to expand on? Should we get through the next slide, I think, first, and then we'll talk about Yeah, we're going to come back to that point about filling <clears throat> in moves. Yep. So let's uh, move on. So um, here's a, a little interjectory rule um, that we should... Um, that we should mention. So filling in moves with flag down. So once either player points out the fallen flag, neither is permitted to fill in or correct any previous moves missing from the score sheet. Uh, it's especially important that a player who expects to win on time not fill in missing moves. Uh, such additions or corrections are not considered for the purpose of determining whether the score sheet is reasonably complete and may obscure a valid claim. Very important. So this usually relates to um, the non sudden death uh, time controls uh, period where someone it's 40 moves say in two hours um, and somebody hasn't made the two hours uh, if your score sheet isn't uh, the definition of reasonably complete I think is no more than two missing move pairs uh, then you won't be able to claim a win on time so um, you, you know if the opponent calls his own flag for his protection which I don't think I've ever seen but if they do uh, then you are not allowed to fill in those moves to be able to win on that time period and you just move the game into the next time period. And then we've got 15C which is score keeping in time pressure and this is the sudden death time control. So this is you know game in 60 or the you know the game in 30 part of a dual time control or multiple time controls. Uh, the last part of it is the sudden death time control. Uh, so again, if either player has less than five minutes, they no longer keep uh, need to keep score. Uh, but in this case, a score sheet is not required to win on time in a sudden death kind of time control. So it doesn't matter how many missing moves they have on their score sheet in this instance. Um, but they do run into some of the issues again with uh, claiming draws um, as the previous rule. Uh, Alan, anything we would like to expand in these particular areas? No, I think you nailed it. Everything determines by uh, whether the time control is sudden death or not. Yep, exactly. <clears throat> so, um, and then 15D. Um, 
Uh, Rob, sorry, I'm just going to answer a quick question in the chat. Rob USDF uh, says, I am assuming if missing moves cannot be determined, then they use a position notation. I'm not quite sure what that means. Um, we might get into that um, later on, I think, in terms of 15F, uh, which is um, filling in moves once you've reached the time control. So if that doesn't cover it, uh, then we'll happily come back to your question or what, what it is you're trying to get over. Uh, meanwhile, there are some NTDs in the chat that can, that can help you, um, you know, um, while we carry on the show here. But I don't want to take your time away from, from watching the show too. So anyway, a player who has an incomplete score sheet and wishes to consult the opponent's score sheet for assistance can ask to borrow it, but only under the following uh, conditions. Both players have at least five minutes remaining in the current time control. So, uh, and remember that says both players, uh, not just you yourself or your opponent. Uh, the clock of the player making such a request is running and shall continue to run until the score sheet has been returned. So if I borrow Alan's score sheet, I have to make sure my clock is running while I update my score sheet and then return it to him. I'm not allowed to make a move until that has all happened. Uh, the opponent is urged to comply with such a request, but it's not mandatory. Uh, if the opponent denies the request, uh, the player can stop the block, uh, stop the clocks and get a TD to help, uh, in which case the TD will come and decide, determine whether um, that is an appropriate request or not and decide whether they can uh, use the score sheet. And then repeated requests of this type may be deemed uh, by the director to be inappropriate and the offender can be um, penalized under annoying behavior uh, prohibited. So I think... Um, those are fairly straightforward. Um, I know I have um, I'd asked, you know, um, had players request the opponent's score sheet uh, when they've had less than five minutes and stuff like that. So it, it is common. You have to be careful with that. Um, however, if they're if they're continually uh, borrowing the opponent's score sheet, then they're probably not keeping score move by move by move. And so at some stage they. You know, I think they should just be reminded that, hey, you know, you should keep your score sheet up to date um, yourself and not necessarily need to continually borrow your opponent's score sheet. At some stage, you put a stop to that um, and you let them um, suffer by not having a complete score sheet. Alan, any thoughts on this? Just one, and that is, I think what happens commonly is a player will omit a single move or half move or ply, uh, if you will. Uh, with the result that white moves wind up being recorded in the black column and the black moves in the white column. And at some point, the player realizes that and gets confused. Uh, and those situations actually can take a little time to figure out. And that's where borrowing your opponent's score sheet is really critical yeah. uh, to sort that issue out. Sure. It happens. And uh, 15E. Uh, in the rule that says borrowing not needed, uh, which basically I would have said um, was was probably the rule was probably not needed, but uh, a player who is able to read the opponent's score sheet without borrowing it is free to use the information gained for assistance in keeping score. Remember that you have to keep your score sheet visible to your opponent uh, and to the tournament director. So if they can actually read that score sheet upside down, um, you know, then uh, you know by all means they can use that information. So uh, we have a question in the chat on the electronic score sheet. How can players show the three time repetition? So this comes to uh, the question of whether they can write the move down on the electronic score sheet prior to it being made on the board. Uh, and that does cause issues. I would highly advise the player with the electronic score sheet, be very careful and keep the opponent informed at all times what is going on. However, I would still have them make the move on the electronic device um, and then stop the clocks and claim a draw. Um, but you, it's highly recommended you keep the opponent informed as to what you're doing, because if you start be seen to make moves on the board um, and be looking at the electronic device, analyzing that move uh, without making such a claim, uh, you're gonna get penalized for that. So um, I would definitely tell the opponent uh, what I'm planning on doing um, you know, and let him know I'm about to make a, claw, a claim by three, four repetition. This is the move I'm going to make. Um, I am obliged to make the move um, and then claim the draw. 
Um, so you know, there's no other way around it. But that is my recommendation on how to do that. Alan, any suggestions on that? No, I think you're right on. Yep. So just just like I said, make, make sure the opponent is very aware of what you're doing at the time. So just to safeguard yourself. Uh, let's move to 15F, and I think this is what Rob UCF was, was talking about earlier. So after the end of a time control, if the next control is not sudden death, so um, if there are multiple time controls, um, say you're playing 40 in two hours, then 20 in an hour, and then sudden death 30, um, after the 40 in two, you get to you know, 20 in one uh, type thing. Uh, so if the next control is each player must make all efforts to fill in missing moves on that player's score sheet. Um, I don't see many time controls nowadays that have three time periods, Alan. How about yourself? No, it's very rare. So more often than not, in one of these weekend events, it's something like 40 and 90, sudden death 30, or something along those lines. Uh, because the next time period is sudden death, um, you know you don't have to necessarily um, make up the moves, um, as, as we're going to find out anyway. But yeah, so after the end of a time control, if the next time control is not sudden death, uh, players must make a, as much of an effort as they can to fill in uh, any missing moves on their score sheet. Um, and then it talks about uh, if it's just one player that has missing moves uh, after the completion of a time control, a player who alone has to complete the score sheet must do so before making another move. Um, and with that player's clock running, if the opponent has made a move, um, an additional board and set may be used. Um, I, I, I very rarely see this uh, nowadays. Um, and then let's move to 15 F2. So this just says basically if both players um, need to reconstruct their score sheets, then uh, in this instance, the clock should be stopped until both players have, have reconstructed the, the score sheets. Uh, and again, additional chess sets and boards can be used to help them um, get, their, um, get their score sheets up to date. And then you see the little disclaimer at the bottom that says this does not apply if the director rules that is unnecessary. So, um, you know, again, you have TD discretion to save them that task. Um, at that stage, they should probably make a note of the position and then carry on uh, keeping score from that point on. Alan, anything I'm missing? There's one thing about this that occurs to me and it always makes me laugh. And that is we have both players needing to fill in uh, missing moves, but one only needs to fill in two and the other has to fill in eight. So the guy fills in his two moves and then starts his opponent clock. Uh, that's not what the rule says. Right. The rule says the clocks don't start until both players are finished reconstructing their score sheets. Exactly. Yep. So, and then uh, if if the reconstruction is impossible or unnecessary, uh, if it's impossible or unnecessary to reconstruct the moves as prescribed above, the game shall continue. So that if this is, goes into a sudden death time control, you don't necessarily have to reconstruct the moves. Players should make a clear diagram of the position reached and the next move played will be considered the first one of the following time control unless the players agree that a later move number has been reached. And then um, this clarifies the situation in if the next time control is sudden death, so the sudden death portion, Upon making the time control, if the next control is sudden death, it is less important to fill in the missing moves. The director has the option of waiving the requirement of reconstructing. So, yeah. So, I think that's fairly simple. Well, anything we need to, so if it's one player, um, they, they need to do that before they make a move on the board. If it's two players, they need to reconstruct the missing moves and play doesn't start until both players have done so. However, if the next camp control is sudden death, you can forget it. Nobody has to make up their score sheet. They just need to make a note of the position and carry on from whatever point they got to. Is that about sum it up? Perfect. <laughs> All right. So, um, like I said, you won't you won't often use um, you won't often have to have people filling in missing moves because most time control games now are either in a single time control game in ninety or two time controls, 40 and two, sudden death one, you know, and, and that's it, so. And then uh, one quick rule here, um, ownership of score sheets. So the score sheets of all games in a tournament are the property of the sponsoring organization. 
Uh, if the organizer requires that a copy of each game score be submitted by the players, duplicate score sheets must be provided. And that doesn't mean two score sheets. That usually means the carbonated copy uh, score sheets. Um, so the players only have to keep score once, and you can keep the uh, the either the main copy or the carbonated copy. Um, I like actually keeping the main copy and giving the player the carbonated copy. Um, so if they don't push through hard enough, then it's their fault, not yours. And uh, any players who fail to submit score sheets may be penalized. Um, hands up anyone who's ever penalized a player for failing to submit a score sheet. I've tried, I really have, but it's, it's, it's something that is very hard to penalize someone for. And a lot of players, especially at the top level, don't want their games out there or something. So <clears throat> sometimes they try and be a very uh, secretive with their scores, etc. So, but anyway, theoretically, all the score sheets are the ownership um, of the organizer. Trivia. Alan, is there anything that I forgot about that I needed to expand on before we move into the trivia? I'm going to come I back. I don't think it. so. I think you covered it very well. Yep. Okay. Are we all ready for trivia? I know this is the, the part that most people have come for. And tonight, uh, I will uh, openly admit that Alan came up with all the trivia questions for tonight. So thank you very much, Alan, for doing that. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult task. Oh. To meet with the uh, audience's approval. Right. Um, I have a question to anyone who can answer it. Is it true that if a game starts with an illegal position, king and queen, it is impossible to fix the position? You know, um, so what I normally do with these shows, um, so you will find that there are some, if you type in exclamation point TD show, you can go back and see um, some previous episodes of the TD show. But I like to keep each TD show um, on subject. So we will not answer that question. However, there will be some other tournament directors in the chat that will happily answer anyone's questions for you. So we are going to push on to the trivia because that's the most exciting part of the night now that we've read the rulebook verbatim. Um, so let's, let's get on to the trivia. So I am going to uh, open up. Uh, remember, uh, you vote by either typing one, two, three, four. You don't need the uh, little quotes. Um, uh, in the chat. So the voting is open, but I'm going to read the question. So the time control is 40 and 90, 20 and 30, and then sudden death 30 with a five second delay. Abigail, uh, playing black, made moves 34 to 40 with less than a minute on her clock and made the time control with three seconds to spare. Phew. Um, <laughs> Before making his 41st move, John, who is Abigail's opponent, obviously, claims a rule violation because Abigail did not record an score sheet the last seven moves played. How do you rule on John's claim? So, did you do all you need to do is do one, two, three, or four. Would you, one, uphold the claim, award a win on time to John, who has made a material, on the basis that Abigail clearly would not have made the time control had she recorded the moves as required? Would you two, uphold the claim, add two minutes to John's clock, and the game continues? Would you three, deny the claim, but instruct Abigail that before moving, she must fill in the missing moves before making the next move, and the game continues? Or would you four, deny the claim without any of the direction, and the game just continues? So we did go over this uh, in 15F, I believe was the part here that is relevant to this. So we've got various uh, people voting. That's very good. Uh, happy to see NTD Ken Ballou in there and NTD Anand um, Domalapati. Uh, Anand, I, you need to give me lessons on how to pronounce your last name at some stage. Uh, Enrique Weder, uh, previous uh, guest on the TD show is also in the chat. Uh, Harold Stenzel, who was a previous guest too. Uh, don't always follow these NTDs folks. They they don't always get them right. <laughs> All right, I'll give everyone a couple of seconds. Everyone had a chance to vote. All right, I think I think they nailed this one, Alan. So what, what would you say your answer is? I would say answer number three is the best option. Uh, she was under no obligation to record those moves under time pressure, but she has now moved into a second time control that is not sudden death. And that creates the obligation on her part to uh, fill in those missing moves. Yep. 
and before she makes her next move as well. So she has to, Correct. because there's only one player, or at least we assume there's only one player that um, uh, that needs to fill out the missing moves. Um, so uh, yeah, she needs to make fill out those moves before she makes her, her next move on the board. And the game just continues. So John is a little bit out of luck in this case. <laughs> Yes, I, I do mispronounce an awful lot of names. You want to hear me at National Scholastics uh, try and announce the prize winners. Anyway, so let's get on to question two. So remember... How did uh, the crowd do on that? Uh, oh, sorry. Yes, everybody got it right. We, we okay. went 100% for three. So that's good. Yeah, I forgot you can't see the results. <laughs> Obviously, too easy a question. Obviously. So let's, let's move on to question two. Uh, uh, and remember question one, folks. So we're going to talk about the same game here. So let's get into question two. Once again, I'm going to open this for voting. One, two, three, four. So about an hour later in the same game, uh, Abigail, having filled in moves 34 to 40, as you directed, uh, once again, barely makes the time control, playing her moves 56 to 60 with less than a minute on her clock. Uh, but again, doesn't record them. John, once again, uh, is trying to play the system here and claims a rule violation. How would you rule? Would you want to uphold the claim or what a win to John, who has made a material on the basis that Abigail has repeatedly violated Rule 15A? Would you two uphold the claim and add two minutes to John's clock and the game continues? Would you three deny the claim but instruct Abigail that before moving she must fill in the missing moves before making her next move and the game continues? Or would you four just deny the claim without any other direction and the game continues? So one, two, three, or four. Oh, it looks like we have some smart people in the uh, watching the show tonight. <laughs> this guy John does, you know. Well, he's well within his right to make these claims, I guess. You know, we're not we're not going to take anyone's right to make a claim away. <laughs> At least not yet. So we have seven votes. Uh, who put who put three? I don't. It's registering a vote for three, but I don't know why, because I don't think anyone voted three. All right, anyone else like to vote before I close it off? All right, let's go ahead and close this one. So, Alan, we had um, everybody voted for four. There was a couple of people who said that three uh, would be acceptable um, in in their books, possibly. So, um, what would you say the answer is? Well, a difference here, I mean, the situation sounds very identical, and of course, that's deliberate. But what's changed is that the players are now in a sudden death time control. And that means it's not necessary for Abigail to fill in her missing moves. So in fact, four is the correct answer. Exactly. So and remember, Abigail had less than five minutes on her clock. So she's well within her rights to stop keeping score. So um, and yeah, so this this is now moving into the remember the time control was 40 in two, 20 in one or something along for, you know, 20 in something and then sudden death. So now we're moving into that sudden death portion. So there's no need for them to bring their score sheets up to date. Anyway, let's uh, I'm sure you can see where we're heading with question three here. So let's carry on with uh, Abigail and John and um, continue their fun. So question three, let me open up the voting, one, two, three, and four. So about another hour later into the same game, John's flag fell while he was making his 68th move. After John's flag fell and with time still on her clock, Abigail filled in moves 56 to 60, those moves she was missing earlier, on a score sheet um, and claimed a win on time. John, who still had many material, objects that she cannot claim a win on time because her score sheet was incomplete when his flag fell. How do you rule? <clears throat> so would you uphold the claim and award a win to Abigail, uh, assuming she has many material, or a draw if she doesn't have many material? Would you deny the claim on the basis that Abigail filled in moves after the flag fall in violation of Rule 13C3 and rule the game a draw? Would you deny the claim on the basis that Abigail's score sheet is incomplete and rule the game a draw? Or would you deny the claim a water forfeit win to John on the basis that Abigail violated rules 13C3 and 13C7? And basically just for persistent, um, I think, you know, claims 
I think you might, you know, want to award John, reward John at some stage, right? I mean, he's it's, it's got to be right at some stage, right? With one of these claims. <laughs> Poor John. What John should do is come and watch this show, and then he will know for future reference uh, when he can make claims and when he can't in relation to keeping score. <clears throat> uh, the last time control is sudden death, yes. So they are now in the sudden death portion of this game because they passed move 60. And as somebody's pointing out, of course, um, it's very important that somebody, even if they have less than five minutes, that they don't have an increment of at least 30 seconds. Otherwise, we would have a whole different barrel of fun with these questions. As we may find out later. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yeah, and as Ken Ballou points out, you, as the tournament director, you are thinking, thank goodness this game is done. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have any more votes before we close the voting here on this game? That's good. Very good. Make sure you get those votes in. All right, I'm going to close, close the... Close the voting on this one. And everybody voted for uh, answer number one. Um, Alan, or what, what, what say you? Uh, yes, it's clear that John has it in for Abigail, that she has done him in on this one. In a sudden death time control, she does not need to fill in those moves. They're irrelevant to her claim. So number <clears throat> one's correct answer. Exactly. And it's irrelevant to, you know, it, you, to, Paul John, who does make this claim, it, it doesn't matter whether she filled in those moves or not. Yeah, and John's going to be one unhappy camper, but such is life. He had uh, various shots. I'm, I'm sure these weren't the only three claims he probably made in the game, um, knowing uh, how John has been acting. So, But hey, such is life. So Abigail wins on time. Yeah, well done, everyone. Uh, let's get in. So I'm glad there are some national tournament directors in the chat, actually, because this next question is uh, I think a fun one um, and so let's get to question four uh, let me open the, the thing here uh, so um, one two three or four so Dolly we're a different game now Dolly's getting the better of James in a game with a time control in 40 90 sudden death 30 plus 30 30 second increment folks but is running short of time in the first time control she stops taking notation after recording move 32 with 4 minutes and 23 seconds left on her clock. At move 38, various moves later, with 15 seconds on his clock, uh, James claims a 2 minute penalty because Dolly is not recording her moves. How do you rule? Do you want uphold the claim and add 2 minutes to James's clock? 2. Uphold the claim add two minutes to James's clock and direct Dolly to fill in the missing moves on her score sheet while her clock is running? Do you three, deny the claim because both players are in time pressure? Or do you four, deny the claim as untimely because James could have made his claim earlier? This one's much more interesting. And then I have some follow-up questions for the for the chat folks here, because I know you and I have already discussed uh, <laughs> this question, Alan. I, I think it's a very interesting question, um, and it is something that I've actually come across before um, in in real life. So, uh, yeah. All right, we've got five votes in so far. And we actually have different answers this time as well. Oh, excellent. Yes, yes. And not, uh, not everybody is agreeing. Hmm, Enrique, we don't have your option up there. So we got some votes for two and some votes for three.
And what I find interesting about this is James, if he only has 15 seconds on his clock, he must have sat thinking for 16 seconds at least before making this claim, right? If you've got a 30 second increment, you can't start a move with less than 31 seconds on your clock. <laughs> just, just a side thought. Well, he couldn't find a move, so he's looking for an alternative. <laughs> Okay, any more votes for any more votes? We got one, two, three, four, five, seven votes so far. And we're split between two and three. All right, let's close the voting off. So we had um, uh, we had five people vote for two, and we had two people vote for three, Alan. How would you handle this one? All right, well, let's deal with three first, because it's obvious that both players are in time pressure. But what those two folks overlooked is that we have a 30 second increment. And because of that 30 second increment, neither player is ever excused from recording his moves. So now you look at number two and say, all right, uh, Dolly did make a mistake in that she stopped recording her moves when she didn't have the right to do that. So James may have a legitimate claim. However, is there any obligation that Dolly fill in the missing moves on her score sheet before she makes her next move? And the answer to that is no, because they're now in a sudden death time control. So the correct answer actually is number one. Right, and so we, we discussed this. So what do you do if Dolly stopped recording at move eight? So now Dolly has 30 seconds left on her clock and has 30 moves to fill in. Are you really gonna make Dolly fill in 30 missing moves? So I said, my answer is situational. Um, if I think Dolly can easily fill in those missing moves in whatever time she's got left, I'm probably gonna make her do it. Um, uh, what do we mean there in sudden death time? Who said that? So, right. Uh, yeah, I don't think anyone said that they were in the sudden death time control, right? No, this is the first part of this time control. Oh, uh, you're right. But, you're absolutely correct. Right. So, but yeah. So, but um, the, it doesn't matter. The thirty second increment means they have to have to keep. Uh, sorry, I, I misheard. Uh, they have to keep score uh, the whole time, but. The, the question comes whether um, you're going to make Dolly fill in these missing moves. And this is where I had the, uh, the question. It's not clear by the rules that we have right now that even if you're using a 30 second increment, that Dolly has to go back and fill in those missing moves um, with the US chess rules at least. So if she's missing a couple of moves, I might make her go ahead and fill those in. I'm still adding two minutes to James's clock here, uh, irrespective. Uh, because she did stop and she's trying to blitz him, um, you know, by not uh, filling in the moves or at least not necessarily blitz him, but she's gaining an advantage by doing that. Uh, so I'm going to happily give two minutes, I think, to James uh, in this instance. But at what point do you make her fill in um, her missing moves is, is unknown. I think the easiest and the simplest solution here is to add the two minutes um, and tell Dolly that she needs to start keeping score from this point on yeah so 1c2 is td discretion um and i think you know you use your discretion depending on um what the situation is <clears throat> remember this says she stopped recording move 32 with four minutes 23 she could just have 31 seconds left by now um are you going to make her fill in six moves with 31 seconds left on a clock um that that could decide the game basically um so you know, um, yeah, and again, there is an option too with no penalty. I mean, you know, I, I don't like the idea of not giving a penalty um, if someone stops keeping score with a 30 second increment, especially when you get into that close to time. But, um, you know, you will always have that option and that TD discretion to do so. Um, but anyway, I, I thought this was a great question um, and, and definitely a discussion point, um, uh, hopefully for the rules uh, folks out there to to consider um, how a TD should handle this or whether it's just left best to, to TD discretion. So uh, 
Uh, why would why would number one be wrong just because it's not sudden death? Um, you're still gonna you can uphold the claim and add two minutes. It doesn't matter whether it's sudden death or not. Uh, you got a thirty second increment. You meant to keep score the whole time. It it's irrespect ir irrelevant whether it's sudden death or not um, to this particular question. This could be at the end of the game. This could be in the sudden death portion. Um, she's got four minutes twenty through. Nobody is allowed to stop keeping score with a thirty second increment. So I disagree that number one is wrong. Um, just because it's not sudden death. So, anyway, let's move on. To, I think that was a great question, Alan. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to question five. Another wonderful question. Let me open up the voting here. Again, one, two, three, or four. Um, in a game with Alexander, Elizabeth has neglected to record a few moves. With 4 minutes 15 seconds on a clock, she asked to look at Alexander's score sheet so she can fill them in. Alexander himself has 11 minutes and 55 on his clock, but he refuses Elizabeth's request. Um, Elizabeth accordingly makes claim to you, the TD. What do you rule? Uh, so one, uphold the claim and direct Alexander to let Elizabeth look at his score sheet. Uh, two, uphold the claim and direct Alexander to let Elizabeth look at his score sheet and add two minutes to Elizabeth's clock to penalize Alexander for unsportsmanlike conduct. Um, three, deny the claim and direct the players to continue the game. Or four, deny the claim, remind Alexander that his score sheet must remain visible at all times, and remind Elizabeth that if she can see Alexander's score sheet without borrowing it, she may use the information on it and direct the players to continue the game. So one, two, three, or four. You're in the TD shoes, you get this claim from Elizabeth. He won't let me borrow his score sheet. How would you handle that? <laughs> What's the time control? The time control is irrelevant. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Uh, so Enrique Weather is asking in the chat, what is the time control and is it sudden death? Uh, my, my, answer to you is does it matter whether it's um, sudden death or not in this instance would your answer be any different based on if I told you it was sudden death versus it was a non sudden death portion of the of the game I don't think your answer would be any different but I'm happy to be proven wrong Well, Enrique can give us the answer that he thinks is true in either scenario. Any more answers before we dig into this one? Okay, give you all five seconds left. Anyone else gonna vote? We've only got five votes for this one. Do we have any more? I know some more people have voted. Ooh. I think I even highlighted how important it was at this stage uh, to, to remember this particular rule. Okay, let me close off the voting. Alan, I will tell you that um, two people voted for number one and Four people voted for number four. Oh, that's uh, very interesting. How would you vote? All right. Well, uh, let, let's eliminate options one and two immediately uh, because Elizabeth has less than five minutes on her clock. And uh, I remember distinctly that Chris pointed this out when you discussed the rule. If you're going to borrow a score sheet, it's necessary that both players 
have more than five minutes on their clock. So we can't uphold her claim because she's under five minutes. So that means we're going to deny the claim. And then the question becomes, do we just deny the claim and let them continue the game? Or do we deny the claim and give Elizabeth a little lesson in uh, what's involved in borrowing a score sheet? Right. <laughs> yep. Probably in normal circumstances, you just deny the claim. And you can point out you're denying it because Elizabeth is under five minutes. However, if you have some reason to think that Alexander was deliberately trying to prevent Elizabeth from seeing his score sheet, you might get into some other details of the rules that says, no, you, your score sheet has to be visible. And if she can see it without borrowing it, she's entitled to do that. But unless you see a real cause for going that far, uh, it's probably more coaching than the situation requires. Yeah, I, I, I think I totally agree with that line, I thought. Um, so I, I personally would go with three unless I, I see that. Alexander Skoshi is not visible to me as a TD or to the opponent, um, in which case I will escalate that to number four. But I don't, I don't, I don't see any need to, you know, if Alexander Skoshi is right there and he's not doing anything to hide it and it's perfectly visible, um, I don't see the need to remind Elizabeth that she can actually, um, if she can see Alexander Skoshi, she can, uh, you know, she can read it without borrowing it. Um, so, so I'm on the three line unless uh, there's a reason to move to four. But I think either option, um, you know, is is okay. Um, you know, I, you know, I, I just like to play it a little more carefully. Um, but you know, uh, I guess. Uh, and and the question in in the chat says, what happens if she wants to claim a threefold repetition? Well, she, uh, the answer to that is she has the obligation to keep an up-to-date score sheet. Uh, so if she's let that lapse, then at some stage, uh, she might not be able to claim that 3-4 repetition. And that's the penalty you play, pay for not keeping your score sheet up-to-date. So, and I well, think Chris, we'll... that's an interesting point, though, because with respect to a 3 repetition, uh, the requirement is a little bit different because it just says that the score sheet has to be adequate to support the claim. Exactly, yep. Yeah, so it, it could in fact be missing moves, but if you can establish from the moves that are recorded that the position occurred three times, yep. or occurred twice on the score sheet and is about to occur again, then you can still... Uh, yeah, for sure. I'm not saying that she can't make a claim. I'm just saying that she might not be able to make a valid claim because their score sheet isn't as up-to-date as it could be. Uh, remember, you can't use the opponent's score sheet to, to validate that or help in any way. So she has to make that claim and use her score sheet to prove that. So that's, you know, if a score sheet is still good enough with the missing moves to prove that it's a three-fall repetition, then by all means, you can award the three-fall repetition draw. Um, but if it's not, then you can't, you, you know, you can't rule out a valid claim. So that's, that's the price you pay for not keeping your score sheet up to date. Alan, I think this was a, a fantastic subject area and one that um, uh, is obviously uh, much needed for autonomous directors to know uh, the nuances uh, and the ins and outs of um, what happens with score sheets. When can a player keep score? And not well, you know, when are they excused from keeping score? Um, and various things along those lines. There's some little things to take on, especially the thing about borrowing the opponent's score sheet. Uh, you know, very, very simple to know that stuff. Alan, do we have any final thoughts on score sheets before we, we head out for the night? It's just what's true about any rule. There's more here than meets the eye. And you really need to really thoroughly understand these rules and have some insight into what lies under them. For sure, as is the case with most of the uh, rules in the, in the US Chess Rulebook. But score sheets is, is one that comes up very often because players um, are required to keep score most of the time. So um, you often run into a lot of issues regarding score sheets. So I'm very happy that we were able to uh, run through the rules on score sheets and, and hopefully give you a little bit of advice uh, and guidance on how to uh, deal with those issues if they come up. Alan, thank you very much for being able to join us tonight and giving us your uh, experience and input on on this topic. It's uh, great seeing you. Pleasure to be here. 
Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to the show tonight. Uh, we will be back next week again, 9 o'clock Eastern, Thursday night. Look forward to seeing you all then. But until then, have a good week. And we're done. Have a good night, everyone.